Support comes from Missouri Forest Products Association, committed to sustainable and sound conservation of the state's forests, which support more than 41,000 Missouri jobs, resulting in a $10 billion industry. Choosewood.com. From St. Louis Public Radio. This is St. Louis on the Air. It's called the Consumer Confidence Report, but any public water utility um, produces this annual report and it gives all sorts of information to consumers about the source of the water and the quality of what they're drinking. So we have the, the Clean Water Act, which controls what we put into streams. I think a lot of Americans think, well, it's just always gonna be there. And then the Safe Drinking Water Act is, is kind of what we pull out. I mean, I think it's safe to say that that all or almost all Americans value clean and safe drinking water. I'm Sarah Fenske. Nearly 50 years ago, Congress came together to override President Richard Nixon's veto and pass the Clean Water Act. The landmark 1972 legislation has led to many success stories. That includes the river of my childhood, the once devastated Cuyahoga, which famously spurred Congress to act by literally catching fire. Yes, in 1969, the flames of the Cuyahoga rose five stories high. Today, it is significantly cleaner. But as two Mizzou researchers note, in a new study, the majority of water bodies in the U.S. fail to meet the Clean Water Act standards. That study was published in Ecology Law Quarterly, and it offers both analysis of what's causing the problems and what we can do about it. And joining us now are the study's authors. That is Robin Rotman. She is an attorney focusing on energy, environmental, and natural resource issues. She is also an assistant professor in the School of Natural Resources at the University of Missouri. Robin, welcome. Thanks so much for having us. And we're also joined today by Kate Trouth. She's an associate professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the University of Missouri and an associate with the School of Natural Resources Center for Watershed Management and Water Quality. Kate, welcome. Great. Thanks for having me. So, Kate, your study talks about how the Clean Water Act did a great job of dealing with point source pollution. You say non-point is the problem. So break this down for us. What is point source pollution? Right. Well, point source comes from a point, from a pipe, and we know where it is and we know where it comes from. And so we know the source of anything that may come out of that pipe. So it might be like a factory. Could be a factory, could be a wastewater treatment plant, and you know anything that that has a, a pipe to it. So, what is non-point source pollution? Well, non-point source is is that opposite. It says that it it comes from disparate sources. It's from all around us. It's materials on the surface that water is able to move as as water moves and carries things and has that great ability. And so it it you know it, the the source is is all of us and everything that we do with our land. So speaking very generally here, what might be the biggest sources of it? Oh, well, we, you know, when, when we think in more urban environments, we, we have our yards and we put fertilizer and, and weed killer on them. When we think about roads, we have, you know, the uh, petroleum products, some of the heavy metals that come off. Um, even sediment, even though it's like natural from, from the soil, if that gets into streams, that can be a, a problem. If we look, you know, farther afield where we might be using more fertilizers, those all can, uh, can contribute and have an impact on water quality. And so, Robin, in this paper, uh, the two of you refer to this as, quote, the biggest threat to water quality in the United States today. How does this affect our water quality? Well, it affects water quality in a number of ways. And as Kate said, the Clean Water Act has been pretty effective at controlling point source pollution because we know where it comes from. And so permitting requirements um, can be imposed. But because non-point source pollution is a more diffuse type of pollution, it's harder to get a handle on. Um, some have heard about the Gulf of Mexico hypoxia, or you might hear about eutrophication or algal blooms. Um, those are largely tied to non-point source pollution from agricultural fields containing fertilizer, which is causing that overgrowth. Um, and can really have serious consequences for the ecosystem. And Kate, when we're talking about problems in the Gulf of Mexico, it's fair to say some of those go back up all the way to us here in Missouri. Is that right? 
Right. Well, about two thirds of the east, you know, the, the two thirds eastern United part part of the United States drains down to the Gulf of Mexico, and we're part of that. And so, yes, we can be, you know, contributing what happens down there in that dead zone. So when we talk about Missouri waterways, you know, as you say, there are so many waterways that have been cleaned up uh, because of this. Kate, overall, are Missouri waterways as clean as they should be at this point? Well, you know, we're we're working, we're making progress. And, and, and you know, when, when the Clean Water Act went in and you know, and engineers such as myself were designing plants and we were making such progress. We're now seeing other uh, constituents that were saying, hey, um, we need to look at these because we're, we're recognizing that, that there's many more of these constituents that, that could be impacting it. And, and so we're, that's where we're seeing a lot of the nutrients that Robin mentioned coming, you know, fertilizer. So nutrients, we're realizing that those are bigger and bigger problems. And now when, you know, even when we think um, from permits with cities, we're, we're starting to, to put in, in uh, those nutrient requirements. So we've made great progress and, and we want to kind of continue to make that, that progress, recognizing that there are these kind of emerging challenges or there are new challenges that we're, we're recognizing are there. So Robin, in light of these challenges and in light of the state of our waterways, do the water regulations on the books in the U.S., do they make sense today? Well, I'd say they don't go far enough to get the job done. So as you mentioned, Sarah, the Clean Water Act was passed almost 50 years ago. Uh, the Safe Drinking Water Act, which governs uh, tap water quality, was passed a couple years after that. And I think one way that they fall short today is that those acts did not acknowledge that there was a connection between ambient water quality and drinking water quality, which obviously we know there is today. Um, and similarly, the Clean Water Act didn't really draw a connection between surface and groundwater quality. So those are some areas where they need to be strengthened. So Robin, can you break that down for me? When you talk about how ambient water quality affects drinking water, um, I'm sure this is common knowledge in your field. I have to say I'm surprised by that because I always thought, okay, once they treat the water, the water's great. It's the water like the Cuyahoga River in my youth that's untreated. That's the problem. What's the fallacy on that? Well, and I wouldn't say it's a fallacy, but we have to think about the technology and the costs associated with that drinking water treatment. And so if the raw water um, that's being taken into the drinking water plant has a lot of contaminants, it's going to cost a lot more money to treat it uh, to a safe level. And so those treatment costs are going to be passed along to the drinking water consumers. Um, but they're not the ones that cause the pollution in the first place. So, Kate, it, it feels like this is kind of the story about water. It's all connected in a way that maybe we don't always acknowledge or think about. Yeah, and I, and it, you know, kind of building off of what Robin was saying. So we have the the Clean Water Act, which controls what we put into streams, and then the Safe Drinking Water Act is, is kind of what we pull out. And, and Clean Water Act do have these designated uses. What, you know, we protect the water for what? We want to be able to drink it. And so if we don't have this connection and we're not ensuring that what is in these streams, and that's the difficulty with non-point source, it's hard to, you know, control that, then when we draw the water out, you know, for, for a, um, a drinking water supply, then, you know, it's, if it's not the quality, then we have to put in these expensive processes. And so we need to be sure that there is this seamless connection, if you will, between saving those designated uses, preserving them, and um, making sure that that happens. You know, you know we, we had, you know, processes with Safe Drinking Water Act that would say, well, we recognize non-point source can be a problem, and you know, have, you can have voluntary solutions. And it, it may get to the point where we need to say, really, we all do need to sit around the table and recognize we need to make this connection and to protect you know, the drinking water for everybody. We're talking today to Kate Trouth, who's an associate professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the University of Missouri. We're also joined by Robin Rotman, and Robin is an attorney focusing on environmental and natural resources issues and also an assistant professor in the School of Natural Resources at the University of Missouri. Uh, you two have this great paper out, and part of what makes this paper so good is you're not just looking at um, the water quality itself. You're also looking at the regulatory framework, at what needs to be done 
done to our laws to address these problems that you're identifying here. Robin, one of the things you're calling for is an amendment to the Clean Water Act. What needs to change to this uh, piece of legislation to make it do what we need it to do today in 2022? Well, even today, the Clean Water Act does not have strong controls over non-point source pollution. So it's taken more of a voluntary approach, um, more of the carrot and less of the stick, um, in encouraging states and landowners to implement some solutions to reduce runoff. Uh, But we're calling for that to be strengthened. And at the same time, we're calling for additional funding to be able to be made to the states for that purpose. I think a lot of states are doing the best they can in this area with very limited resources. And so additional congressional funding would allow them to keep a closer eye on non-point source pollution. So, Robin, you note in this paper that it has been politically impossible to amend the Clean Water Act in a way that would (laughs) give it some teeth. If you couldn't have it done the way you want to have it done, the simple way of of amending this Clean Water Act, what would be another solution here? Um, Well, I'll I'll answer that question first. I would say that um, that's exactly right, that this is a situation where Um, Because we have not seen the legislation advance, the courts are left to grapple with this problem of what water bodies are covered by the Clean Water Act and to what extent should they be regulated. And so we've got 50 years now of litigation um, up to the present day where the Supreme Court has been trying to tackle this issue. And, you know, that's that's not good for anyone. The courts shouldn't be making the law. The courts should be interpreting the law and applying it to specific situations. So Congress has kind of made a mess of this by not keeping up with with what's needed today. This just ends up just constantly snarled up with judges having to decide. Exactly. And there's also been a sort of a political ping pong um, at the executive level. So with different presidential administrations, they direct the EPA and the Army Corps of Engineers, which also has some Clean Water Act responsibilities. to either broaden or restrain the scope of the Clean Water Act's regulatory authority. So almost uh, for the past 10 years, we see one administration come in, they make a rule on how they're going to deal with this. The next administration comes in and reverses it. And this creates a lot of uncertainty for landowners who want to know what's expected of them. Um, I think most landowners or businesses or municipalities want to comply. Um, And in order to do that, they need to have clarity over what water bodies are governed by this federal legislation. Yeah, I mean, that just seems like it's it's no way to to come out with, with regulations that work on something like water, where you can't just change course overnight. So you're talking about maybe an amendment to the Safe Drinking Water Act could really help us here break through on this impasse. What would you want to do with that, Robin? Sure. Well, we suggested the amendment to the Safe Drinking Water Act because it is politically less contentious. I mean, I think it's safe to say that that all or almost all Americans value clean and safe drinking water. And so this might be a better path forward towards compromise. Um, And what we're calling for is a better synergy between the Clean Water Act and the Safe Drinking Water Act. So right now, the Safe Drinking Water Act has fairly light Um, regulations when it pertains to surface water quality. It's much more focused at what's happening in the drinking water treatment plant and in the distribution system. But if the Clean Water Act could be amended to have additional controls over source water, um, that would improve the raw water intake and ultimately improve drinking water quality. So, Kate, Robin and I were talking about uh, just the broken federal government there. I'll just quickly summarize it as that, um, you know, so many times people are able to actually get things done by doing things on a state by state level. Some states are on board for increased regulation and so they can clean things up. Um, Why does this need to be a federal endeavor for this really to work? Well, it it needs to be federal because we I think we need to have the same approach because these are all of our waters. Our waters don't respect state boundaries or county boundaries. It's really watershed boundaries. And so we need to have have that perspective that this that is, everything is connected. It's all of our waters. And, and we need to, to, to recognize that that movement and we are impacted by upstream and we impact downstream. So, Kate, when you talk about watersheds, I find myself wondering, how does well water, which is a huge source of water in rural areas, how does that play into all this? 
Well, we can have the infiltration and water can that's that's on the surface may sink into the subsurface and may what we would call recharge the groundwater. And so materials that are on the surface can move and get into our into the groundwater and into those supplies that that those who are on on wells use. So this is a big issue, and no matter where your water is coming from, this is something people need to be paying attention to. And yet I feel so few people are talking about this right now. If we talk about the Clean Water Act, we think about, okay, it fixed the Cuyahoga uh, problem done, it's solved. Robin, do you think we take water for granted in some ways? I, I think we do. I mean, we're so fortunate in the U.S. to have had early and good um, water and wastewater infrastructure. And so I think a lot of Americans think, well, it's just always going to be there. You know, the the water, we can trust the water that comes out of the tap, and we can trust that our wastewater is being taken care of adequately. Um, and so I think it is time for people to educate themselves a bit more about, like, where does their drinking water come from? Um, I would encourage anyone listening to to try to find out more about that. Uh, one thing they can do is obtain a, it's called the Consumer Confidence Report, but any public water utility um, produces this annual report, and it gives all sorts of information to consumers about the source of the water and the quality of what they're drinking. So that's a, that's a great idea there. Um, I feel like people listening might also be wondering what we can do as individuals. Uh, let's talk about how we can limit our contributions to this non-point pollution. Is that something, um, Kate, is this something where we could make a difference? If so, what, what's something we need to be cognizant of? Well, many of us um, have lawns in our, our yards, and, and we may put fertilizer on there. We may put uh, you know, uh, weed control. And so when we think about just that little bit in our little piece of the earth, what we're doing, if we can, you know, use less of it or use to think about when we use it, if it's going to be raining, well, we don't want to put that on our yard shortly before we're going to have a rainstorm because it's going to run off. So those little, little things or, you know, the using, uh, washing your car, perhaps at home, um, using less water when you you know when you when you clean it and not having so much runoff put a little rain garden in your home so there's a lot of little kind of individual things that I, th- I think we can do to contribute robin what about on a political level um what can we do there well i think it begins with um people recognizing this as an important issue and making their voice heard um of course there's so many different uh demands and and ways that our decision makers are pulled in different directions. And so as constituents, we can signal that this is an important issue to us and that we would like something to be done about it. And Kate, is there anything municipalities can do if, say, the mayor's listening? Uh, what, what could they do now that they're not already doing? Well, I think I, I think municipalities are working. You know, a lot of, you know, with, when engineers are involved in, in developments, I think that you know that there are requirements for treating that that uh, that runoff from the rainfall. We you know it, in communities a lot of times when there is redevelopment, we'll even have those programs. So I think communities are working and and need to continue working. But I think we just need you know to expand the the universe of of the places and the 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 considerations for for what's what's. Uh, you know, for what's running off the surface and into the stream. So it's a it's a, an urban and a rural uh, problem that we all need to kind of work together on. A problem we need to work together on. Well, I, I hope, against hope, that this is something we can do. Kate Trout, thank you so much for joining us today. Ah, thank you. And Kate is an associate professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the University of Missouri. Robin Rotman, thank you. Thank you for having us. And Robin is an attorney focusing on environmental and natural resources issues and also an assistant professor in the School of Natural Resources at the University of Missouri. This episode was produced by Emily Woodbury with audio engineering and podcast design by Aaron Dorr. Our executive producer is Alex Hoyer. St. Louis on the Air is a production of St. Louis Public Radio. Understanding starts here.
Do you find yourself regularly listening to episodes of St. Louis on the Air? Suggest us to a friend you think might enjoy our conversations. And leave us a review and rating on Apple Podcasts on the App Store. It's the simplest way to help people discover our show. Thanks. St. Louis Public Radio is a member-supported service of the University of Missouri-St. Louis. Support comes from Missouri Forest Products Association, committed to sustainable and sound conservation of the state's forests, which support more than 41,000 Missouri jobs, resulting in a $10 billion industry. Choosewood.com.